We certainly appreciate being here today. We're going to give our attention to Jason Street. Who's that? Have you given anybody uh, awkward hugs lately? I've given a few. All right. We're going to give our attention to Jason Street. His theme is How to Protect Your Banks and Enterprises, a talk by someone who robs banks and enterprises. <laughs> so uh, I like to start these kind of talks with a, uh, a legal disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer, but I played one on the Internet, and uh, this is it. I'm adorable, okay? I will not try to steal from you, kill you, or ruin you financially unless you pay me first. There's always a contract. So when I talk about some really horrible things, and in some of these versions of this talk, every talk I've done this year has been different, it's like, but every version has one thing in common. It's really, really evil. So when I get to some of those points, just remember the kittens. I'm adorable, I, I'm not a bad guy. I'm just really good at playing one, you know, for good reasons. So the key thing about this talk, you're going to see a common thread, and it's just how we suck at risk assessments and how we're not worried about trying to defend our stuff so much of what's really going after us. We're defending our stuff, defending ourselves from things that really may not actually be going after us. And we need to go and start scaling back and actually defending the stuff that we need, that we can do immediately and effectively right now instead of worrying about all those other threats that are coming out there. Uh, this is the perfect example because this was the Super Bowl uh, from this year. Uh, Vice President was there, 5,000 police officers, Secret Service, uh, probably some in the audience right now. Hi, guys. Uh, and uh, a lot of other kinds of law enforcement and feds uh, there at that event. High security event, tier level one security. Three teenagers went through a chain link fence. They found a ladder and they were like, hey, let's just carry this ladder in and see what happens. And guess what happened? Everybody let them through. There's three guys carrying one ladder, 5,000 cops are like, yeah, seems legit. Yeah, go through. <laughs> What's up with that, right? The best part about it is the YouTube all of it. <laughs> Guy Fieri and TMZ made cameos on this YouTube video. It was amazing. So there's your high level security event. It's like they were worried about all these other kind of threats, but they were, you know, not prepared for teenagers and a chain link fence with a hole in it. It's like you may want to worry about those things. Uh, least important slide, but it's got to be in there. I'm a blue team and a red team guy. So I don't just try to destroy the stuff. I like try to fix it as well. But how can you properly defend your networks and your companies and your corporations and your enterprises if you don't really know how they're attacked? And that's one of the other main themes of this talk is how do you attack them? So, because we suck at risk assessment. Remember in 2015, it was the Ebolas. Oh my God, the Ebolas came to America. Everybody flipped, this is worse than Shark Week, right? Or the summer of the shark. It's like Ebola's came to America. How many people died from Ebola in America? Two people. Two people died, and that's tragic, that's not funny. Two people died from Ebola, that's horrible, right? <laughs> 50, <laughs> why are y'all laughing? Y'all are horrible. Now you made me laugh and I look like a jerk. It's like, okay, at that same, well, yeah, okay, yes, that is true, I am a jerk. But still, it's like that same year, that two people died from Ebola, 55,000 Americans died from the flu. So while you were out there preparing for the Ebola to come and get you, maybe you should have taken a flu shot. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Well, I mean, I'm saying it to them because they're dead and that's still once again tragic, okay? <laughs> but seriously, that's their threat they were looking at was something so out there and scary that the news kept reporting but what they could have been doing is taking basic care of themselves and maybe surviving. And because what do we fear and what do we actually go after? The leading cause of death in perspective. Leading one, heart and circulatory disorders. That's something I'm worried about. Do you know how much bacon I consume every day? It's like, that's horrible. I got to worry about that. That's a big threat for me. Uh, I've already had cancer, so YOLO. And, uh, but look at the very, 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 very bottom. The little bitty, little bitty, little bitty, little bitty, top right there. Terrorism, you know, 
But what are we feared the most? What's driven our economy so much? It's like, what's empowered the TSA to be so idiotic? Terrorism. I have to grab your cotch, sirs, for the security of America. <laughs> you know? And that leads to another problem. Because once again, we may not even know what we're supposed to be protecting ourselves from, but what we do is we put in these institute, these policies and these things of saying, and telling the employees and not informing them properly of what they need to look at, so they do pattern matching. They'll go like, well, this is the scenario and this is how I need to react. We don't give them the leeway to actually think critically. There's no critical thinking in a lot of the security postures of a lot of corporations, enterprises, and let's say governments. Because this is my actual USB drive that was confiscated by that TSA agent. Do you know why that USB drive was confiscated? Because it looked like a grenade. That's it. It matched the pattern, exactly. The, well, no, I tell you, I pulled the top off, showed them that it was a USB drive, and then they're like, we well, can't take it, we have to take it. I'm like, no, I gotta destroy it. Because I actually had some malware that would actually mess with their machines, and if they plugged it in, then it would be my fault. And then it's like, <laughs> I mean, I was like, no, I gotta destroy that one, because I'm not getting another rap, right? I now carry a USB drive grenade in my bag, but I take the top off and put it in another pocket, it goes fine. It's good. <laughs> I've got a machine gun and a pistol in my bag, USB drives, but I put them separately in two different pieces. It's like, they're totally cool. It's like, because it doesn't match the pattern. Don't we all feel secure when we fly out of Vegas you know, on Monday? Yay, <laughs> right? So that's one of the problems uh, as well. And what are we actually looking at? It's like it doesn't just go from physical, it's also from online. Everybody's worried about zero days. You know, zero days. Oh my gosh, they dropping O days in here. Oh my God, well not here in this talk, obviously. But you know, it's like in DEF CON, they're dropping O days. We've got to worry about this, worry about that. Uh, SQL injection has surfaced as the number one attack in 2015, probably 2017. SQL injection is not a security vulnerability. It's crappy coding. Stop treating it as a security vulnerability. And people will say, well, Jason, still, you know, crappy coding can be a security vulnerability. SQL injection is not a security vulnerability. It is crappy coding. If, you got a, if you're getting owned by SQL injection, you need to talk to your uh, coders, not to your security department. Well, you need to talk to your security department to watch out for those coders because they're up to some sketchy stuff if they're still putting SQL injections in their stuff. <laughs> All right? But who's coming after you? What are your threats? Is it nation states? Are you worried about nation states? I mean, I wouldn't be worried about nation states. Well, maybe a little bit. But, um, uh, but look at these, you know. It's like you got nation states. If, unless you're running a centrifuge in Iran, maybe. Or maybe you're uh, owning a telecom company, maybe. Or you're the pope. Seriously, we spied on the pope. Not that sketchy one with the red shoes, but this pope, the current one. The guy who dresses up as a regular priest in Vatican City at night and feeds the homeless. He's like the Batman of Popes, he's awesome. <laughs> and it's like, and they still spied on him. What's up with that? So, uh, and also, we don't have to worry too much. This was actually from the Vault uh, 7 lulls. The root password for the SSH uh, um, system was 123 ABC DEF. So it's nice that our government is actually using, you know, upper and lower case and numbers, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so that's awesome. Are you worried about anonymous, you know? How many people in here is from Anonymous? You failed! <laughs> so it's like, uh, are we really worried about them? Because it's like, I mean, I like that last article where it says, could the hacker group Anonymous do any real damage to Donald Trump's campaign uh, in the, in the, as it's foretold or, or threatened? No. Sorry. It's like a moment of silence for that one. Um, how about criminals? Maybe criminals are out to be your threat. Maybe you should worry about getting robbed. Maybe they're the ones that are actually nation states with nation state tools, uh, hacking activist groups. Yes, those are threats and potential threats for certain areas. But the majority of people, you need to worry about your stuff getting stolen. People want to rob you. It's like, you know, you don't want to be a target of cybercrime. Couldn't resist the pun, sorry, that was awesome. 
they lo Target lost over a hundred million dollars from that breach so far. So far, it's still losing. It's like uh, it's horrible. Did they their their security controls were they the vector of compromise? It was an HVAC system company that had a trust relationship. They uh, compromised the HVAC system with a spear phishing campaign that they like to say was a sophisticated attack, <laughs> whatever. Um, and they, uh, they attacked the target. And that's how they got compromised, because of the trust relationship. It's like, and, and that's one of the things we're gonna go after a little bit more as well. And talking about spear phishing emails, you talk about zero days, fish gets me every time. It's like majority of workers blindly open email attachments, attachments, especially if they think it's from someone they know. Because why would someone send you something, you know, that's malicious? That's just me and root, right? So what I usually do at this point is when I gave this talk in South Africa, I Googled biggest bank in South Africa. That totally didn't work as well as I thought it would. Uh, but, uh, but when I went to Paris, I Googled biggest uh, bank in France. And I randomly would pick a target from that search. So I would be, and, and every single one of those, I actually, the person who was an employee from that bank in all those different countries were in the audience. It was sort of awkward, but fun. Uh, and it shows you that it can be that much of an impact. It can be that random and arbitrary. You're being attacked right now. But this is DEF CON. And it's like, I didn't want to just go after our biggest bank because y'all would be all cheering me on and going, woohoo, and the banker person doesn't care. So it's like, they're probably not in here, right? So I decided to do a little twist because Chris, uh, you know, was like invited me here. I wanted to make something special for him. So I decided to put a little bit of a different theme on it. And let's go have society on this one. Let's take down the government. Anybody with me? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So just like uh, F Society, I'm just going to go random and I'm going to try to find the, and it's based in New York. So let's go after one of those one percent or one percenter companies, the Power 100 New York. That's where they list all those fancy companies making all those money with the hedge funds and the uh, Ferraris and all those people, right? Evil Corp. Uh, I did some searching on there, and I see the, the might have been best exemplified by related companies. Hold on. Related companies. I didn't even know that was real. I mean, that's just like E Corp, right? That's just like a random name that like, doesn't sound like it's real. That's one of those generic names. So, yeah, let's attack them, right? So I'm going after related companies now. So this is my now target. So as I'm targeting related companies, I just Google related companies. It's that easy. Uh, I know the CEO's name. I know their headquarters. I know the founder. I know when it was founded, the subsidiaries, uh, subsidi whatever, uh, the type of businesses, and the profiles, because they're on YouTube and Instagram, because they're hip related companies, right? Uh, so let's go look at some of their, their stuff. Uh, let's go to their uh, website. That's a pretty website. And that's how normal people see the website. When normal people go to a company's website, this is what they see. Have I ever been accused of being normal? <laughs> Never. So how do I see and an attacker see this website? Well, with this wonderful thing called extensions. So now, from just going to the website, all I have is their IP addresses, their hosting information, the NS lookup numbers, uh, I know it, it's sort of disappointing because they're actually really well protected and sort of irritating because uh, they're using a lot of third-party services to help them like SunGuard DNS and uh, pphhosted.com for their mail server. Uh, really no joy. I was really unhappy about that because usually I've, I've got a lot more information at this point and y'all going, ooh, ah, but now you're just like, yeah, it's lame, Jason, you're right. Um, <laughs> I did come up with this. All the domains that are listed on that IP address were things like onewarpark.com, related.com, then a whole bunch of .cnn, uh, I mean a .cnn, .cn, there we go. A lot of China domains, and, I, and I'm F Society, right? So is Dark Army involved in this? I don't know. I'm a little nervous now, though. I'm a little nervous about this. Let's see what happens. So it's like uh, I go on from there. Uh, let's look at some of their social media profiles. There's YouTube, because who wants to do, I mean, Bloomberg seems very exciting and, and, and interesting, so yeah, they got a lot of views on that one. 
what was it, 36 in three months? Yes. Uh, so y'all, uh, so, sorry, I, I don't mean to disrelate it, .com. Uh, but here's our Instagram. That's hip, and those are some nice pictures of buildings. Um, and, but they've got 1,800 followers, and they're only following 170 because they're very selective. Uh, that's nice. Let's go over their uh, LinkedIn profile. Here's, I love LinkedIn. LinkedIn's like the Facebook of corporations. It's like, I will accept, by the way, I will accept every LinkedIn invite that I've gotten. I've accepted all of them. And it's like, because that helps, you know, spread my, my connections. So if you want to send me a LinkedIn invite, feel free. Uh, I'll take it. Um, and so right here at LinkedIn, you see on the related companies, you see there's 1,600 targets, I'm sorry, employees uh, on LinkedIn uh, that I can go after, uh, which is awesome. And then we look over here, this is their Twitter profile. That's sad, it's like, because uh, everybody knows I love to tweet. They're following four people, they have 309 followers, they've got one like, and they haven't tweeted yet. What the, how do you get 309 followers without even tweeting? It's like, I don't know how that happens. But, uh, but they, they manage that. Um, Here's their social profile, Facebook, because, you know, I usually like to go after Facebook to go after employees. Uh, I have mostly every attack has, I've done uh, successfully through a company has gone through their Facebook profile or their Twitter profile. But remember, I'm F society. Okay? I'm going after the man. I ain't going after the employee. Okay? So here's the about page. This is where I usually go and pick my targets. So I'm looking at this long list of, you know, diversity here, and uh, I'm trying to figure out which person uh, I'm trying to attack, right? And uh, I come across this one guy, it's like, that's straight out of Mr. Robot, right? <laughs> Timur F. Galen. If that's not a made up name, then it's like, that's an alias. He's like, he did something shady in his youth right now. You can tell that's a really poorly done alias. Sorry, Tim or Tom or whatever it is. Uh, he's the executive vice president. He's going to be my patsy. He's the guy I'm going to act like I'm, I'm going to assume his identity. And it's like, and how do you assume identity? You've got to find information about him. So here's already some right now. Uh, he's been around. He was at Goldman Sachs. So he's part of the man still, you know, part of the 1% there. Uh, these are some of the things that he's done, some of the places he's been. That's good information. Uh, I do a little bit more uh, Googling on him, uh, get a little bit more information. Um, I get to his LinkedIn profile. Sad. <laughs> Alias, right? That does not look like a legit profile, some kind of executive uh, person in a company. It's like he, like he created it and then like stopped halfway when he realized how horrible LinkedIn is. <laughs> it's like, it's like I'm, I'm just done. Um, but that, I didn't stop there, right? So I, I, need, I don't need to find that much information out about him, you know, because I'm just trying to assume his identity. It's not like I need to really find out where he lives, his home phone number, uh, his address, and where he was born. Uh, but I did. Um, so... That's cool. It's like, cause they, and you know what? Maybe we want to like send him off onto the Hamptons and take over his uh, apartment. It's like, uh, and that's cool because we guy can Google map it uh, and we know where it's at and we can do something like that. So now we've got a pretty good amount of information on Mr. Timmer, right? Um, what do we need to do now? We need to find out the victim, the person we're going to attack and compromise so we can take over everything, right? Let's go back to this wonderful list here. Um, I literally, let's, let's just look down the list, and I see that poor guy at the very bottom just like, oh, what about me? <laughs> it's George Perez. So let's go after George Perez. He seems like real... <laughs> I'm, I don't know what movie he was in, but it was a bad one, right? <laughs> it's like, you just see, that guy's got like a, a, like a Persian cat somewhere that's a big armchair that he's done. He's done horrible things in his life is all I'm saying. Sorry. Uh, here's some more information about him. He's a vibrant urban center. Is reflected. He's really a nice guy. He helps with the art, and he's like, it's not going to stop me from attacking him. But I just want to note that he's a, he seems like a really nice guy, uh, even though he does wear those shorts in public. Um, <laughs> so uh, this uh, gives me some information about his art. It gives me some more information about where he lives. All information that I can use to make the spear phishing email real. I want as much information that I can make the uh, spear phishing email real. How do I send the email though? I gotta figure out what their email addresses are and that's hard. Um, no, it's not, sorry. Um, I go to email-format.com. I type in the domain name and then they give you a nice little list of first name, last name, how the, uh, their emails are sent out. 
And this one was actually sort of funny. Because when I did this one, it came up with another, uh, that comes up with another tab. And this tab actually shows you where those email addresses have been used. And when it did, I saw that one that was highlighted right there. It was really weird. It was un a Union Square uh, leasing at related.com. And it went to this website and it said guest and it had a number. And usually I don't do this, but all about hacking is usually just going on your instincts and just going, well, what if I do this? So I went there. That doesn't look good. <laughs> Does that look good to anybody? I mean, I got into social engineering, so I wouldn't have to be technical, but you know, even from my perspective, that don't look good. So I went through that, that code a little bit. It's like, I tried to act like I did, you know, like CSI, but not typing on two keyboards. Um, and I went to the main website and I'm thinking, yeah, that's not good for them. So they may want to fix that, FYI. Uh, I don't give uh, warnings, I just let you see it and see. Um, so hopefully they'll fix that eventually when they get to this or start the uh, restraining order. Um, so now the next step is very important. Uh, this is the part where I do have to do an extra kid in warning, okay? Because if I send you an email about something good, something nice, like you won money, what are you gonna do? What the f ever, that's fake. No one sends me anything free, ever. So that doesn't usually work. So what happens if you send them something bad? Something that's horrible that's happened. After the Boston bombing, within a day or so, I got an email it said Boston News. It literally had an IP address on it, slash Boston. That was it. <laughs> Your daughter was running in the Boston Marathon that day. You had relatives that live in Boston. You didn't know what was going on. CNN was giving you news about what was happening. Did you click that link? When tragedy strikes, we want to know more information. During different uh, times in this, in this talk, in different places, I've used the murder of two girls. I've used a terrorist attack in Paris. I've used uh, political unrest in South Africa to create my emails. Remember the kittens. But I'm an evil mother because I'm trying to steal from you. What part do we forget about that? Have you ever been robbed by someone going, I'm sorry about having to do this, dude. It's like, uh, I know this is a little overkill. I mean, no pun intended, but I need all your money in your wallet. Okay, I mean, I'm, <laughs> this shouldn't have to be necessary, but I will kill you if you don't give me your money. Okay, please, I'm sorry. It has to be like, but I need your money. You don't get mugged like that unless you're in Canada, right? <laughs> it's like, seriously. I am trying to steal from you. I broke into a building in a wheelchair before. I am a horrible person. I'm trying to rob you. So of course I'm gonna use deaths of people. I'm gonna use tragic events. You know why? It increases my odds of you clicking the link. And that's what I want. So what do I need to do now? I need to Google up some tragedy. Problems in Miami, quote, related group which is our company. So, and I mean, you know how hard it is to Google freaking related anything? It's like, <laughs> th this was like the worst assignment I gave myself ever, okay? Usually this thing takes under an hour to get ready and done. It took me forever. I mean, like at least two hours and I was not even playing Overwatch at the time. It was like horrible, okay? So, but I did find some dirt. This was at the beginning of July of this year did Miami's biggest developer avoid labor taxes? The feds are investigating. Go on, <laughs> right? It's like, this is by Nicholas Nihamas, and it talks about the, at the very bottom, at Edificio Panera, yeah, that uh, building complex. So, I got it. Let's send an email. Please note, it's in red, I used a comma, not a dot, Dear feds, F you, I didn't do anything bad. This did not actually go out. This is a demo for hypothetical demo purposes. Uh, so it went to george.perez to from timber.galen. Notice I'm using CCC and BCC because I didn't send it out. Subject line is, this is very concerning. We need a res uh, response immediately. Three exclamation points. You know why? One exclamation point, I'm sort of excited. 
Two exclamation points. I'm, I'm shouting. Three, serious business. Okay? <laughs> that means you got to pay attention to this one, mother. Something's going down. Right? So, greetings, George. I've just been contacted by Nicholas Nihamas, who says he's been reporting on our issues with the, that place. Uh, he just published a more disturbing article, which if, his, uh, if the accusations regarding you bear out, will be leaving us with some tough decisions. I've already made inquiries to some old colleagues from Goldman Sachs in Moscow to find out what they can. We need to get ahead of this situation before it sinks our whole enterprise. Take care, Tim F. Galen, sent from a mobile device. Did I tell him to click that link? Did I tell him he really needed to click that link? Did that SOB click that link? <laughs> probably. <laughs> We're gonna go out on a limb for the demo person. I probably think he would've clicked that link because he's like, because you wanna know what's going on. I'm not telling you to do something. I'm telling you about something horrible that's happening and I'm giving you a way to find out more. And that's all that's necessary. So, I also have a confession to make. And it's like, you know, just a little bit of one. Um, I lied. I'm sorry, my friends, but my confession is I couldn't trust you. So uh, there was a little bit more uh, to this than, uh, than I was letting you on to, because I'm trying to disrupt the government. I'm trying not to just take out, like, the related.com. So what else did I decide to do? This wasn't random. All my other talks were pretty random and arbitrary. But there was for a particular reason why I picked George here. Just a small one. I like that. George is bestie pals with somebody that I may actually do want to attack. <laughs> so what do I need to do? I needed to compromise George first. Now I've compromised George. And now I can send emails out as George. Who am I going to be sending out an email to? <laughs> right. But how? You know, someone, a certain, exactly, through Twitter. It's like, uh, <laughs> well played, sir. It's like, so how do I contact him? I don't have this, you know, how do you get the president's personal information? Uh, maybe Pastebin. Uh, please know to the feds, okay, I did uh, obscure information that was de necessary to obscure uh, because I heard that he'd be pissed on, I'd be pissed off um, <laughs> if, I, uh, if I let this out for information. Secret Service did tell me, he said, if you release that, you're in trouble. And so uh, I wouldn't do that. Um, so this is his official, there's his birth date, his social security number, uh, all of Trump's personal email addresses that he uses, uh, also all his family members' uh, personal email addresses, uh, all his Twitters, his YouTubes, all that uh, on Pastebin. So, yeah, that happened. Um, <laughs> but now that I've got a way to email him uh, on his personal email address, look at all those cameras coming up. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a horrible person because I should be clicking to the next slide, but I'm waiting. <laughs> Are we good? <laughs> Hold on, I got it. All right. Half the people taking pictures are probably Secret Service to screw me later, but you know, whatever. So now I need to find a way to get him and, and, and create the, the target, right? The email. I've got to create an email that'll make him click the link. Um, so I just Googled reporter Trump hates the most. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it's going to work, right? So I found this guy, uh, Wayne Barrett, who authored a book that painted Trump's financial history as at the least shady. Really? That's my shocked face, by the way. Okay, <laughs> clutching the pearls and everything. So, um, so now I've got everything I need to know to create an email. And yes, there is a little thing because I really didn't change the first one very much. Uh, here it is to chaos uh, uh, RQ at Yahoo, which is his, uh, George from George Perez. This uh, is looks, it's going to be a huge issue. No matter our differences, we need to get ahead of this. Three exclamation points. Now, two things. It's like I needed to do misspellings because that way you'd understand it better. Uh, and, uh, and two, they've had a falling out. It's like actually George and uh, Donald have actually had a falling out. So it's like I need to make sure that I understood that because I'm actually coming in like I'm trying to be concerned. 
So, greetings, Donald. I've just been contacted by Wayne Barrett, who says he's been writing a new book about you. He just published a very disturbing excerpt from his new, for his new book, uh, which of the accusations regarding you, Peral, will be leaving us with some tough decisions. I've already made inquiries to some old colleagues from Goldman Sachs in Moscow, which he probably knows too, <laughs> to find out what they can. We need to get ahead of the situation before it gets worse. I still consider you a friend. I do not want you to see you uh, being attacked this way. Uh, take care, George Press, and from a mobile device. <laughs> no way he's clicking on that link, right? <laughs> Be even funnier if he did it from his Android phone that he's no longer using and had a stage fright exploit on there. So I think that's successfully how you would disrupt the government, you know, is like you taking over the control of the person who's actually supposedly leading it. So, um, and you say, I'm trying, I'm sorry not to get too political. I, I promise you, if you look at my DEF CON 18 talk, I showed you how to assassinate President Obama. So I'm, a, I'm an equal opportunity attacker. So, um, so and, and also another thing is, um, I sent from a mobile device. And the reason why I do that is because why? Because when you see that, you make allowances. I don't know how they say hello, greetings, salutations, what's up, dude? You know, I don't know those. I don't know how they say, take care, see you later, hasta la vista. It's like, I don't know. But when you see sent from a mobile device, the person goes, okay, well, they were just in a hurry. They're just typing it out. And so that's the reason why all my emails, no matter what I'm, client I'm using, always say sent from a mobile device because I don't care about spelling. So I think we can all agree, job done, right? Okay. Now, guess what? This is my dessert and vegetables talk because I just gave you the dessert. I hope we all had a good laugh. We all realized, more importantly, how simple and easy it is to craft an attack. How an attacker will look at your system and use your social media, use the information that you're willingly to give out against you, right? Can we all agree that that was a, a good way to explain that and show an example? So let's actually see what we can do now. Give up? Maybe. How many people have been to a talk here where someone has gone and said, and this is how I broke this, and I dropped the O-Day, and it's broken, and I just trashed it. The whole GUI needs to be written. The company didn't know what to do. They're not responding properly. It's horribly trashed. Okay, I'm done. See you later. And you're like, how do you fix that? Well, I don't know. I just showed you how to break it. It's like, Those suck. If you're going to show me how something is broken, you better have some ways to show me how I can fix it or you're wasting my time, period. So that's the way I look at this situation. So let's start doing some defensive stuff now because this is what the whole thing is all about. This next thing, this is a defensive talk. Surprise. One of the things you can do for your company, if you don't know how to do OSINT, if your employees don't know how to do OSINT, there are assets and ways for them to learn and to get resources for that that you don't have to work on. OSINTframework.com will be one of those resources. It's a drop-down list for your employees to go through to start looking at your site, your company, as an attacker would. Because you have to look at your company like an attacker would because attackers are looking at your company. Here's another thing. Uh, I'd like to thank April for pointing this one out to me. Mike Basil actually has a distro that you can boot up on for nothing but OSINT and social engineering purposes. It's like the Kali Linux for OSINT. It's like, a, which is like, in Kali Linux is like the Uber for hacking. But still, the, uh, that's a great resource right there to give you all the tools pre-configured, pre-scripted out to help you do OSINT. To start looking at your employees' profiles that may be damaging to your company, that may be used against you. Also, we've learned how awesome Pastebin is, right? We already know that. Do searches on Pastebin. Pastebin has an alert feature. Your company's name, Hackard, Hacksword, Carded, bin number list. It has the way to send you an alert when you put in the keywords to let you know, hey, you just showed up on Pastebin. And, and, and I'll just, heads up, there's hardly ever any reason you show up on Pastebin that's good, okay? <laughs> I, I, I have never heard of one yet, okay? I'm like, oh, look, I've been on, oh, Pastebin, 
Yeah, awesome. Another thing that you could do is see what your, com your devices are doing out on the internet. That's Shodan. And look at all the, look at this. Just like in the zombie movie, that many red dots is not gonna end well for you, right? <laughs> That's never a good thing. It's like all those are exposed and possibly compromisable machines and servers. And you know, a normal person would just leave it at that and just let you know to worry about it. But no, I like to go further. Let's look at one of them. This guy right here, 154.16.5.170. That's a lot of ports to be open to see. It's like, uh, I mean, a lot, right? Uh, so let's go and look at them. Here they are, uh, they're NetStack Limited. Uh, and they're going to be even more limited after this is over. Uh, there's the ports. There's the, they got open SSH running. That's nice. Um, and look at the versions. That's what I like looking at, the versions of all these different servers. It's makingmoneycoach.com is their post-fix SMTPD server. Awesome. Uh, they won't be making much money after this, right? Um, not my fault. It's already out there. Um, I go a little bit further. I see the Apache. They're running an Apache server 2.4.25. Yeah, that's concerning, but we'll get to that a little bit later. What's on that Apache server? Oh, that is. Who wants to guess the user ID and password is admin admin? <laughs> I would not know. I'm not a bad person. I didn't actually check. I'm just saying it probably is, okay? <laughs> but I was more concerned about the version because you can just Google the Apache 2.4.25 and see vulnerabilities and see what comes up and stuff like this comes up. They may be having some issues, if not now in the near future, like by Monday. Um, <laughs> and you have to ask yourself, okay, well, Jason, who's really going through Shodan and trying to find vulnerabilities on servers and companies? Why would someone do that? That's just mean. This mother does it every day. <laughs> Right? I mean, he's doing this, just why? You know, because he can. Look at the things that he's found. It's like, and before WannaCry came out, before WannaCry hit, 1.17 million hosts scanned, 33,468 uh, 33, uh, found infected. I mean, that's what he wants to do on a Friday night. I'm not going to judge, you know, it's like cool. You know, it's all, we all have hobbies. So it's like, that's already out there. People are attacking when you're physically at your house. You need a, you forgot to go to the store real quick and pick something up. You feel safe. Let me leave the door open, you know, or unlocked and just run out there. My neighbors will watch me. When you connect a computer onto the internet, your neighbors are now China, Russia, Paraguay, Texas. You know, New York. It's like, it's everywhere. Especially Paraguay, you gotta watch out for the Paraguayans. Any Paraguayans in here? Okay, I just like saying Paraguayans. Okay, so you gotta watch out for that because those are your neighbors and they are constantly scanning. They are looking not for you. They're not looking for you, they're looking for an IP address that shows vulnerable, that shows that it's available to be attacked. That's all they care about. Not nationality, not political correctness, just you're vulnerable, I attack you. Um, if your teams are small and limited, start using blue teams in boxes. You got Tenable, you got Rapid7 does some good stuff, Pony Express does some good stuff. VThread is really cool because it actually does virtual threat uh, uh, intel for your corporation's internal network. Actually shows you what an exfiltration attack looks like. Uh, so I'm not here to hype products, I'm just here to tell you that those are some cool things that you can do. But literally, the biggest tool in my toolbox that I use more than any other tool ever is this. <laughs> Sir, or Bing, if you want to get adventurous, you know? It's like, I mean, <laughs> like I said, I attack everybody equally. So, now, what else can we do? What are some of the key things that we can do? Well, here's some things that I learned from Ubix that I want to share. This is one of my favorites. WPAD. WPAD, if you've got WPAD on your network, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, Microsoft is anything but helpful. I mean, I, I, everything and helpful, right? That's what I was trying to say. Of course, Microsoft, love you guys. Uh, so what do they do? They made it where 
if there was a host name on the internal network or the corporate network, and the host name was WPAD, well, that means all your workstation traffic should go through it. Guess what every attacker in the world's computer name is? Yes, W. Well, after they change it from Cali Linux, it's, they change it to, you know, WPAD, <laughs> right? It's like, and that's what they do. So here's what you need to do. Make a null route to 127.0.01 and the DNS entry for WPAD. So that way it just no routes. It doesn't go anywhere. Keep WPAD from communicating. And if you possibly can, just disable NetBIOS. I mean, unless you're running Windows XP. Anybody here running Windows? Don't even raise your hand. Don't make me sad and cry, okay? <laughs> it's like, that's bad and you should feel bad, okay? So you're probably not running Windows XP, so maybe not so much with that. Another thing to use, and I love this one. This is the most, I love this one the most. But please understand, my qualifier, if you don't do step four, you're screwed, not my fault. Step one, create a user called domain admin underscore temp. I mean, literally create that in your domain, uh, um, uh, your main domain controller. Put a password in the description. Say, password is, let me think, uh, I want to be secure, password two, okay? <laughs> Delete account by July 2016. Make it realistic, right? And then you add it to the domain admins group. You literally make it a domain admin account. And you're saying, Jason, are you effing insane? Yes, but that's not the point, okay? Step four, under the login hours, you set to zero. What that means is they can never log in. The password is correct. It doesn't send an error that the password's wrong. It just doesn't log in. So you set up an email alert in the SIM and the an event viewer that someone used that account. You now have a zero false positive that someone is attacking your network and has compromised your domain controller. Zero false positives, zero dollars, very little evidence. You detected a breach. No blinky boxes required. That's something you should be using on Monday. So what else do we do? Uh, credit where credit is due. That's all Rob uh, Fuller. Uh, Twitter is Mubix. Uh, cool guy. Another thing that I see way too often that really makes me sad, and I'm going to wait because everybody's taking pictures of Mubix's uh, info. OK, there we go. There we go. Um, unsegmented networks. What's up with that? Why are we keeping our networks all nice and open on the inside? I literally had to stop an engagement on the first day, tell the uh, client that I was not charging them, that they had to use the money to actually put someone in how to create a network. It was a flat network. And brother, when I say flat, I mean the web servers were on the same 10.xxx network as the accountants, HR, web developers, CEOs, email server on the same network. The kicker, the guest wireless access point that was unencrypted had the name of the company's name and guest, where was it? On the same 10.x network. I literally was like, how can you try to pay me to pen test a network when you're just, it's open? It's like, <laughs> It's like you're asking me to break into a house and you forgot to put walls up. It's like, I just, I don't know how to do this. I, I, you, you, you win. I, 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 I don't know. It's like, I literally have no idea. If you're trying to confuse the attacker, you worked. It's like, segment your networks. Is there any reason why HR needs to talk over the network to the web developers? No. Is there any reason why the accountants need to talk over the network to the web developers? No. Is there any reason why the CEOs need to talk over the network to the web? Does anybody need to talk to web developers is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay. okay. It's like, no. It's like segment those networks. Make it like a submarine. It's like if one part goes down, it's like if a submarine gets hit and it doesn't destroy it, what happens? One part is breached but the rest is safe. You know, that sucks for Bob in engineering, but still, the rest of the sub is okay. So you want to do that. You want to segment. Now, here's some, a list of uh, tips and tricks that I want you to start using. The very first one is patch. 
How many times, are we tired of hearing that? You know what's even more tiring? Having to keep saying it. That's pretty tiring. Remember, WannaCry happened two months after the patch came out. And you're thinking, well, that's horrible. They should have known better. Mother, listen here. <laughs> DEF CON 2002. The vulnerability for SQL Slammer came out. September of 2002, Microsoft came with the patch. February 2003, SQL Slammer hit. That's not the sad part, by the way. I'm getting to it. Check your firewall logs when you get back. Guess what you're going to see? Traffic for SQL Slammer. I don't want to go through the line, but you understand that's an unpatched system that's running SQL that's unpatched on the internet that's infected, still going on. If that doesn't make you want to drink, I don't know what does and I don't drink, okay? And so it's things like this that make an impact. But it's also a false impact because when something like this hit, people take notice. When it gets this bad, like on the second day, they really take notice. So there are probably more people patched for MSO 1117 than MSO 867. Because MLS 67, if you do pen testing, is the golden ticket, right? And everybody thought MSO 1711 was going to be, yay, it's the new one. But now, because of WannaCry, mother, it's like, no, they're all patched for that. They're like, oh, no, we've got to get that patched. But what about those ones from 2008? Oh, no, we can leave those. It's like, who uses that, right? It's like, let's make sure we got that one patch on. It's like, that's how they think. You have to make sure your policies dictate patching every month. And not just the OS, but all the applications that are out there. Make sure you're patching your Adobe and your uh, Java and your Adobe and Java and the Java and the Adobe. Uh, like every week on maybe on those. But still, make sure you have a patching policy for them. Another thing to do is a one-by-one one pixel GIF. And I literally Googled, trust me, you can see that. I Googled 1.1 one one pixel GIF, and there's actually one there. Um, put it on your website. Put a link to it to a page that does nothing but record the IP address, the operating system, and user agent string of whoever clicked it. Because how many people are, do you know that are on a website going, I wonder if there's a secret pixel. I wonder if there's a secret pixel. I wonder if there's a secret pixel. Okay, I did that once, but I was bored and it was like 3 in the morning. Okay, don't judge me. Okay? But what does click on those links? Bots. Phishing people scraping the whole website for a phishing attack. Nikto, open VAS, and trust me, there is no, if you run a bank site and Nikto's perusing your website, they're not looking for their mortgage loan, okay? <laughs> Nikto's never there to check to see if, they're, if they qualify. It's just not going to happen. So make sure you're alerting for those. And better yet, just not alerting to the fact that those user agents are going on to, onto your website and people are scanning it but then start blocking them. Your user agent strings, you have a list of bad user agent strings that you can tell your web server to refuse. It's like, you know, no Nikto, no open VAS, no Internet Explorer. It's like, no, I mean, I'm sorry, 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 that last one. That was my web server, sorry. It's like, uh, so you can just say no to these user agent strings and shut them down. They don't eliminate your risk but it helps to narrow it. I'm not trying to tell you how to solve everything. I'm trying to help you be a little bit better secured. Another thing is, start blocking countries. Anybody here doing business in Paraguay? You're shady. No, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> like, a, but if you don't do business in Paraguay, why is Paraguay allowed to see you on the internet? If you don't do business in Canada, because, you know, Canadians, it's like, you should be blocking Canada from seeing your website. Your whole entire network should be blocked at the firewall. The ASN number should be blocked if you don't do business in those countries. It's like limiting the attack vector. Also limit spam. And you tell that to your executives, and they'll sign off on it immediately. Okay? It'll help lower our spam. Oh, yeah. Let's, let's get that going. Let's get that done. So um, you want to do that. And speaking of spam, it's like in spear phishing and emails, do you own all the different domains and variations 
that, that could be used against you. This is one of the saddest slides I've ever, I've ever created. This was a talk I did in 2012. And the reason why it was so sad is, as you can tell, PearsonFoundation.org and PearsonEd.com, uh, one with the zero and the other one with the one, were available. Seriously. Uh, they're not available anymore. That was a popular talk. It's like, I don't know who owns it. Hopefully Pearson does, but I doubt it. Uh, so <laughs> th they were available at the time that I gave the talk. Um, that's sad. You should own the variations of your uh, website. Uh, it's not going to solve your phishing problems, but it, once again, it helps lower the risk. It helps to mitigate it. Another thing is, sad but true, sometimes your employees need to click on a link. They need to click and download an attachment. First of all, you teach them how to be suspicious of those when someone's sending them if you weren't expecting it. But the next thing you can do is tell them to go to places like virustotal.com, tell them to upload the URL or the package. If the attachment only has non-private, non-secret, uh, you know, confidential information, tell them to upload the attachment. I mean, because let's face it, this, this site's owned by Google, they probably already have it, right? So it's, like, it's not like you're like divulging secrets, it's something they already got. So uh, tell them to do that, scan it, to see if it's actually a virus, to see if it's actually something there. Um, yeah, sort of five minutes, but maybe more. Um, so now, <laughs> The, one of the next ones is web developers should be building good code, which makes it more secure. <laughs> SQL injection is not a security vulnerability, it's crappy coding. So, last but not least, see, I'm to the last and not least part, it's pretty cool. It's like, uh, create teachable moments for your employees. Your employees don't always, I mean, this is going to be a shock to you, but maybe, just maybe, your employees don't learn the best lessons by taking that you know, 20 question quiz, multiple choice, that they can go back and change the answer if they got it wrong on their internet every quarter or year, right? Maybe not. So create teachable moments for them. Uh, go and have your security team go around every uh, building, every uh, site that you own, and look under the keywords for passwords. Sad part is they'll probably find some. But more importantly, the employees will know that you're looking for those things, that you have a security team that actually exists and actually in the real world that could do something like that. It's like that creates a teachable moment. I gave a talk a couple years ago where I went to all these different security conferences and these are all results from those conferences on a Wi-Fi pineapple showing people, oh look, y'all connected on those. That's sad. Um, it was very sad. Well, it was even sadder. I went to RSA. They invited me to speak. Uh, never since. Um, but uh, within seven minutes, 42 people connected to my Wi-Fi pineapple. RSA, a security event full of security people. I heard a lot of the SSPs go there. It's like seven minutes, 42. I mean, I could have gotten more, but come on. The lucky number seven and the answer for the life, the universe, and everything, I had to stop there. Um, but you're thinking, Jason, that's an old example. What's a teachable moment for us now? How many people have gone to this website? Raise your hand. The answer is none. None of you gone, have gone to this website. All you guys went to this website. <laughs> See? You thought you were going here. You went there. Uh, to make it a little bit more clear, I've uh, put a different graphic on the website now that I showed you the first time. It's this one. <laughs> Social-engineering.org.cgi-bin.email slash confirmation slash index.php. It's like, if you actually go there right now, you will see that llama judging you harshly, okay? <laughs> As it well it should. Uh, I own cgi-bin.email. So that means I can make everything my subdomain. Humans, when they're looking at the web, even if it's Eastern culture or Western culture, no matter which way they, they write, on a website, they read left to right. Computers always read right to left on a web address bar. So they don't care what my subdomains are. But humans look at the email, they look at the URL, they go social-engineering.org, that seems legit. I've seen CGI bin before. Email, this is an email that they sent me. I'm getting a confirmation. Yeah, I should click on this. Oops. <laughs> so there you go. Now I want to leave it with one last important thing, okay? 
there are good employees. This is an example of an actual pretty good response from Mandalay Bay for Black Hat coming in uh, this uh, first part of the week. They used that conference as a teachable moment for their employees. Not by going saying, oh, close down, we don't accept uh, USB drives now because only email attachments because we're gonna get pwned because the hackers in town, UPS. But no, they didn't do that, okay? What they did was say, hey, this is a good time to be security week. Learn, here's a good security tip on email phishing. It actually tried to teach them a lesson using this as a way for a teachable moment by having the conference there. That's a proper way to do it. And once again, that's a positive thing to do. Are you doing positive messages to your company, to your executives when they do something right? When they actually get security right? Do you create a, pos a positive teachable moment? Or is it always negative, something that someone's failed at? Results may vary. So I'm gonna leave it there. But I got 14 seconds, so screw the questions. Sorry, we're just gonna go with several minutes of uncomfortable silence. And I'm gonna drink here. No, I'm seriously, it's done, thank you. <laughs>